first day. It's here as a visitor for the year. So it's here at Stanford, and so I see him about dresses um, um, during, the, during the week. Oh, I'm interested in the application of programs and sort of the expertise of programming language, your papers and citations. Uh, yeah. number of sources and one of the most prolific creative people in the world has, has been Nate and his, his students. So it's terrific to have him here just as that intersection between program and languages and networks uh, <coughs> takes place. So it's a very, it's a pretty, very interesting time, very interesting topic. But I'm going to hand it over to Nate. Great. To take it yeah. Thank you, Thanks. Nate, for being here. It's really fun to be here. The last time I was here, I was really nervous uh, because I was talking about a verified compiler with built-in cock, and I was thinking, how am I going to tell the net seminar about proof of sentence and verified <laughs> compilers? It seemed to go okay. Today, I hope it's a little closer to home. Um, I thought I'd start actually with just a quick advertisement. Um, the best part of it, being a professor is to get to work with people who are much smarter than you, and with your students. And tomorrow, uh, my students up in small codes here is going to give a talk on uh, a language we've been developing for network programming that's based on uh, probabilistic semantics. Uh, so it can sort of a, one of the big steps beyond uh, all the deterministic languages that have been developed over the last two years. Um, so that's 12 to 1 here in Gates 463. So if you're interested in uh, network programming, probability theory, continuous math, uh, come to Stefan's talk. Um, and I also want to start with a bit of throat clearing and just say uh, this project is actually a Wonderful collaboration between uh, some colleagues, mostly at uh, Colorado Boulder. Um, so Pavel Cherny is an old friend of mine from grad school who is um, an expert in verification and synthesis. Um, and his student, Jed McClurg, uh, has been leading the charge uh, on everything I'll tell you about today. Um, and my postdoc, Hossein Hojak, who just started a faculty position at Rochester Institute of Technology, was also uh, quite involved. Um, there's also a local side to the story. So this whole project actually started when Todd, who's now here uh, as a PhD student, uh, came to my office looking for a, a project with his friend uh, Andrew, and so uh, we thought about trying to do something involving synthesis and networks, and we wrote a little workshop paper, and it sort of blossomed into this larger project. Okay, so uh, I won't say too much about SDN, because I assume uh, in, this, in this credit I don't have to, so SDN is exciting because it's sort of letting us um, change the equation about sort of what, you know, how we build, uh, how we build networks. Uh, in particular, we can uh, sort of get away from much of the sort of hardware-driven uh, designs and start to think about uh, programming networks in software. But um, software is hard to write. So you know, one of the questions that um, my group and, and a bunch of other related groups in the field community are looking at is, you know, how can we best write all this software that's going to uh, operate networks? And uh, one approach, of course, is just to sort of uh, you know, directly program uh, the networking devices using the interfaces they provide. Um, that's, that's certainly one way you can go. But there's this other approach uh, which I want to give you a taste of today uh, called software synthesis, where we basically use uh, powerful tools to generate the programs that run the network automatically. So coming from Cornell, I have to start with a cheesy analogy. Uh, this is my favorite place on the Cornell campus. It's the dairy bar where you can get wonderful ice cream made by the Cornell cows. And they have all these wonderful pictures inside, um, things like the, the world milking champs from I think 1954 or something. Uh, these are the two guys who could, uh, whose cow could produce the most milk uh, in the championship uh, event. Um, and they all, which is of course the modern way that we get milk from cows. You know, farmers aren't hunched over a stool. Really, we have these big machines that. And, you know, it comes from big farms where the cows are sort of automatically curved up to machines, milk comes out, they go out, the next batch comes in. So uh, the sort of, you know, what, what we're trying to do with synthesis is to sort of do the same kind of uh, transformation from, you know, writing code at low levels of abstraction and, and by hand uh, to be able to uh, automate and, and make systematic the construction of software. OK, so the sort of vision is, you know, what if instead of having to write complicated, concurrent, stateful, uh, machine-level code, programmers could just somehow sketch you know, the structure of their program? If they could maybe write the program, not by you know, writing down sequences of statements and control flow and loops, but maybe just give examples or scenarios that the program should handle. 
maybe they're going to give some kind of specification of what the functional behavior of the code should be. Maybe they'll write down some high level requirements for sort of how it should operate. Maybe there'll be resource constraints they express in some abstract way. And then a tool would take all these things and sort of automatically synthesize a correct and efficient implementation. So that's the vision. And uh, sort of pictorially, you know, this, this is sort of a, an old idea. It goes back to the, the 60s and 70s in the software community. So my yellow boxes are all very faint, I'm sorry. Um, so the idea is that we start from some kind of specification. And then we have a tool that can somehow turn that specification, which is much more abstract than the program that we're going to run, into uh, actual XML code. Yeah. Call it a compiler. <laughs> well, so here the specifications are, are going to be uh, even higher level than, say, you know, the highest level language you can think of. So it might just be, you know, a logical formula that says, you know, what the functionality of the program should be. So to take a classic example, you know, if you want to implement a sorting algorithm, you might just start with a description of what a correct sorting algorithm is in logic and then derive from that, you know, insertion sort or quick sort or whatever your tool is able to do. But there's no um, NLP or anything involved in so bring in first order logic of the first state. Uh, there are some people who are doing that, but for this talk, I'm going to assume we're starting with some formal artifacts that whose semantics we understand. Okay, so um, I've already sort of hinted at this. You know, the, the sort of classic view was that we're going to start by writing down logical formulas and then maybe iteratively refine them into code. Um, the sort of modern view of software synthesis uh, is that the programmer might provide a bunch of uh, specifications or, or partial descriptions of what a program might be. Um, so there's this idea that started at Berkeley, has been developed at MIT called sketching. And the idea is that, you know, maybe you want to sort of write down the top level structure of the program, but leave some holes and let the synthesis tool fill in those holes. Um, a lot of tools do use, still use logical formulas, but there's also a sort of growing body of work where uh, rather than writing down uh, logical specifications, people just sort of give examples. Um, and maybe the sort of most prominent example of this is uh, Sumiko Wani's work at MSR. He's written a series of papers on uh, doing things like uh, synthesizing spreadsheet transformations in Excel uh, from examples that are in your in, in your spreadsheet already. Okay, so there's lots of ways you can sort of express high-level insights about the way you want code to function. So when I see talks on synthesis in uh, PL venues, they often the kind of grand uh, uh, motivation I've just given you. you know, we don't want to write code, we want to just somehow sketch what we want to generate the implementation. And it, then there's always sort of this abrupt change they actually do. Um, and you know, often it's much more limited than that. So you know, it's, it's not the case that you're sort of automating you know, programming completely. You're really somehow filling in or, or just generating small specific components um, that, do, that do limited things. So, I always find this frustrating when I when I go to some of the stocks and sort of they start with this, you know, we're going to change the world and and completely to what they actually do. Um, but I think in networking, there's actually um, more of a hope of being able to sort of achieve wild success. And there's a number of reasons uh, for this. Um, so first, uh, if you think about sort of what a network program is, um, they're often very large. If you think about a program as somehow the description of, of the control plane and maybe all of the data plane configurations that it generates, you know, that's kind of a, a very large program to write down explicitly. But they're simple. So, you know, typically there's no, nothing like a loop in a network program, um, except maybe in the control plane protocol. And they're often highly structured. So there's a lot of redundancy, a lot of symmetry in those programs. So, uh, you know, these characteristics of network programs, I think, make them especially amenable to synthesis because they're so big that people don't really want to write them down explicitly. And because they're simple, um, the tools that we'll use to synthesize programs will be able to exploit that simplicity uh, to be able to uh, achieve very good performance. Um, another reason that I think synthesis is sort of really promising this domain is that um, often the desired behavior you want is pretty clear. Um, so if you contrast this with other domains where synthesis has been applied, like graphics or uh, data transformations, um, there you have you know very complicated, uh, a, a wide class of sort of complicated transformations that that could have many properties you want them to satisfy. Um, and you know it's it's hard for programmers to write down code. It's also hard for them to write down specifications. So a lot of work that starts by assuming well the programmer is going to write down a logical specification of what their their code should do, 
that's often a non-starter. In networking, um, you know, there's often a, a sort of simple set of properties that we want the network to provide. It should give us connectivity. We might have path constraints. We might have some resource constraints. We might have operational things, you know, traffic engineering kinds of constraints. Um, and so I think there's more hope that we can sort of have simple, high level, and yet still precise descriptions of what we want the network to do. And that can be used to drive a synthesis tool. Um, and then uh, the last bit is that, you know, the, I think that really the most challenging aspects of, of network programming uh, stem from uh, maybe two main things. One is uh, the fact that you often have very limited resources. So things like memories on the data plane devices can be, can be very constrained. And there's a lot of inherent concurrency. If you think about the network-wide behavior and the fact that there's many, many packets flowing through the network, um, you know, dealing with all those possible interleavings of packets flowing through the network is one of the things that's most challenging and that leads to uh, a lot of bugs. And both of these things are places where synthesis-based tools can really shine. So being able to incorporate resource constraints that's relatively easy to layer on, and uh, being able to maybe functional behavior you want, but synthesize the concur concurrency control for the network. Uh, that's an area that seems especially promising. Can I ask you please, yes, please, please stop with questions. I'm very happy if I only get halfway through my slides. Um, your name is on some of the best papers in the last few uh, couple of years. I haven't read most of them, uh, but uh, <laughs> my desire. All so the work that you have, you know, uh, which has come out, such as the paper called SNAP, the paper called The Fast, and your work about, about uh, the cetera. So if you're talking about synthesis, uh, is your work sort of complex? Is this work consumed in that category? Um, it's not really a technical question. I guess these things are all related. I guess as a researcher, I'm interested in that we express network programs and, and you know the linguistic aspects of that, the mathematical aspects of that, um, algorithmic aspects of that. So um, from that sort of 50,000 foot view, they're all closely related. Um, from a systems perspective, I think the motivations for this work would be very different. Um, and maybe that's what you're picking up on. So you know, one line of work is sort of trying to figure out what are the right high level, intermediate level, low level languages for writing these SDM programs. And this is sort of an orthogonal aspect. Maybe how would we generate those programs you know, given some other inputs? Well, I was trying to understand what you mean by synthesis. OK, so why don't I keep going? And I think, okay. I think it'll become clear. OK, so what I want to try and convince you in this talk is that you know, although you might be skeptical about synthesis, in fact, I'm very skeptical about synthesis in general, I think in networking, uh, there's a set of problems that are especially amenable to, to solving using synthesis. And so what I'll tell you about is uh, two pieces of work uh, that we've done in the last couple of years, one on using synthesis to generate uh, update protocols, and the other on uh, something akin to the SNAP paper you mentioned. So how can we, how can we use um, ideas inspired by synthesis to generate uh, stateful programs? Uh, that um, uh, that sort of deal with the tricky concurrency aspects of uh, network-wide stateful programming. Okay, so let me start with uh, this, this first topic, which is uh, how we can synthesize network updates. So um, the sort of motivation for this uh, piece of the talk is, uh, if you look at uh, the structure of sort of a cartoon, uh, let me call it classic uh, SDN controller, there's a network down at the bottom, there's some kind of controller, maybe a set of controllers uh, that they're coordinating to decide how that should behave. And then there's an application that sits on top. And the application responds to various kinds of network events, things like topology changes or shifts in, in traffic. And it generates uh, new configurations for the devices in the network. And the problem, of course, is that uh, you know, the application has this kind of global view. Um, but the network itself is this big distributed system, many, many thousands of devices and in, in, you know, medium-sized networks. And so there's a question of how we can take these directives that are generated by the application and implement them correctly in the network. Um, to say it a little more abstractly, you know, the, the sort of the view of the application is that the network is transitioning from one global state to another, to another, to another. And so in between each of these transitions, uh, there's some initial state, which let's assume the network is sort of correctly in that state. Uh, and we want to 
to move to some target state. Um, and, and the problem, of course, is that you know the network has many devices, and there's no easy way to sort of get from the red states to the blue states um, without silly things like stopping the world and you know reconfiguring everything. So in practice, you know the the, the atomic instructions we have allow us to do one piece of um, so even if I allow myself maybe to update atomically, I'm going to have to step through you know, a series of intermediate configurations where the network is somehow in a mixture of red states and blue states. Because you know, the behavior of the network, you know, packet forwarding behavior, can break in variance in my program. So I might have carefully crafted the red um, me connectivity start mixing together path segments that consist of sort of red paths and blue paths, those invariants may not be preserved. And at least during the transient period that I'm uh, implementing this update, I could end up breaking uh, connectivity for certain. OK, so let me show this uh, in a little bit more detail. So here's um, a, a sort of simplified data center topology. Um, it's got three layers of switches and some hosts. and the Part of the configuration that I'm updating is I want to go from, I guess switch my colors here, but I want to go from the blue path, which is written with a solid line, to the red path that's written with a dashed line in red. And so, you know, what, what I can do is I can go update these switches one by one, uh, causing them to change how they forward the H1 to H3 traffic. Um, so, what I'm going to view sort of an update program or an update protocol is a description of in what order I should manipulate the state on individual devices. Um, and just to simplify things, I'm going to assume that we're updating entire devices all at once. All of this works if you update you know, single rules on a single device also. Um, just the problem becomes a little bit larger. Um, so for example, one update program could be you know, update T1 first, then C2, then A3, and then A1. So jumping back and forth across the network. And I think I have an animation that will do this. So if I, if I do this naively, uh, as I just showed you, um, I can end up with uh, problems. So for example, here, um, I have a packet, and it's going through the network. So initially, it goes on the blue path, and it's directly delivered. But now, if I start updating the switches, so maybe I update T1 first. So now it switches from that blue path to the red path. They have to be the same, but I've, up I've updated that T1. And then I update A1, which switches now in a meaningful way from the blue path to the red path. Now, if I send a packet through the network, you know, right at the right moment, um, C2 might be configured just to draw packets that it doesn't have uh, have rules for, and so I've broken connectivity between H1 and H3. Or to say it a little more precisely, we created a black hole, even though our configurations themselves did not have any black holes. And you can concoct lots of these kinds of examples. Um, you know, any any kind of path property you can think of. Uh, you can violate by you know cleverly picking a series of, uh, of updates for, for a concocted topology that caused that property to be violated. So here's another one that I think uh, a little more serious. Um, you might argue that in the previous example, well, it's just a transient black hole; it goes away. Who cares? Things happen fast. Um, but uh, if you have uh, path properties that are involved in implementing things like security, so here what I'm assuming is that there's actually some important filtering that happens uh, on devices A1 and A4, but not on A2 and A3. And now, similar example, if I update T1 and A2, you can see that a packet can flow on the solid path. And now, even though the two policies both waypointed all traffic across it to be steered across a path, it doesn't go across a fire wall, just by splicing together this red path and this blue path. We've broken access control. Okay, so is this really a, there's actually, in certain circumstances, there's good reason to say it's not a problem. Um, I know that people at Google did some measurements and looked at the impact of these kinds of transient violations uh, for their, uh, for their, there's other situations, maybe the most uh, prominent is from, I think, 2013, where I don't know the exact details, but uh, I think network configuration change ended up shifting traffic onto a backup network, causing congestion, causing loss, causing uh, more uh, 
more mechanisms to kick in and sort of further break the network. And they ended up having to sort of completely reboot a whole data center, more or less, and took down AWS and lots of uh, lots of services that were hosted there. So um, about four years ago, we um, wrote this paper where we proposed that uh, instead of letting programmers directly update devices um, themselves, we should have controllers that give us mechanisms that can ensure safety uh, while we're doing these updates. Um, and we propose a set of guarantees, but the simplest one is something we call per packet consistency. So the idea is that the network is going to be going through this series of intermediate states that are not things the programmer wrote down. But from the perspective of any single packet, it will be as if that packet saw a single consistent version, so either the initial state or the final state. Um, so the way I kind of like to visualize this is we're sort of going from red to blue. We go through these intermediate states, and we can, in a generic way, con concoct the states on those intermediate devices to sort of have both the red and blue behaviors. And a little more precisely, what we do is something we call a two-phase update, which is just a sort of network version of a two-phase commit or a two-phase lock uh, from databases and distributed systems. So we basically tag all the configurations in our network with explicit versions. We install the new configuration in the core. That's what's depicted here. And then we go around the edge of the network and install the new configuration. We wait for all in-flight packets to exit, and then we do it all the old configurations. And the reason that this works is that after we've done this first phase and have the new configuration installed, um, we can basically do both behaviors. So at the edge, we can decide, you know, incoming packets should have old behavior and new behavior, and we have all the state needed to implement both. And now, in any order, we can go around the edge of the network and uh, map incoming flows onto, you know, incrementally from the old to the new configuration. And then there's some garbage collection that happens. So this gives us, you know, it sort of avoids all the violations of path invariance that I showed you before. Um, and it, it sort of works, you know, for any topology, for any configuration, and in fact, for any property. Um, so this is nice, but it has a couple of limitations. One is that it doubles the peak memory usage on, uh, on switches because we have you know, at, in the middle of the network, we have both configurations installed during the update. Um, and that may be a showstopper. And the other limitation is that this protocol that's sort of methodically going through and updating device by device uh, doesn't exploit a lot of parallelism. And, you know, switches can take tens of seconds to update their tables. And so if you do this across the network, this can actually cause a significant amount of delay in implementing one of these configuration updates. This doesn't seem like I mean, rocket science. I mean, that seems like a lot of what kind of what like MPLS path protection has done for years. And in fact, I wrote a paper proposing kind of the same thing in 2011 for for network snapshots, where you know you move from an old epoch to a new epoch. To the next epoch. And and I I guess it, I mean it, the interesting thing is that if you're switching. You can double the memory usage, but if you're just switching one path or a few hosts at a time, then it, it, it doesn't, and you sort of roll it over. And I guess that's thing number one. And thing number two is that the updates of the secondary switches can all be done in parallel, so that's kind of what's typically done. So I guess I don't understand either problem you're describing. So uh, I could just have you give the rest of the talk, I think, because I'm going to show you some uh, general ways to get mechanisms that have the nice operational properties you just described. Um, there are pathological cases where if you want per pack consistency, you're going to have to do, you know, you're going to have to have um, both configurations on some of the intermediate, in some of the intermediate states. Yeah, I guess I guess the point is that it, it only has to be for for that path, right? If, unless you're doing the, your, you know, so so it's not necessarily doubling the, you know, table usage of your whole. Network. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it's just sort of incrementally increasing it by a certain amount. For sure. <clears throat> okay, so um, Bob, Bob's on to what <laughs> what we. Uh, uh, looked at when we tried to generalize this work. So one way to view what this per pack consistency gives you uh, is captured by the correctness theorem that we proved in our second paper. So we proved that, in fact, consider any network update, not just a two-phase update, but any mechanism whatsoever that, uh, that provides per pack consistency for a given topology, configurations, and so on. Uh, that's going to hold if and only if that update preserves all safety properties or all, if you want, path properties of the packets that are flowing through the network. So that kind of tells you why, why it's sort of canonical and why it's so powerful, uh, why it might be expensive. So you know, if you think about it, the, the, a given program, it certainly has a set of invariants that it cares about. 
but it probably doesn't care about preserving all of the properties of all the packets flowing across those configurations. And yet, a per pack consistent uh, update must do that. So, the questions that we asked were, you know, can we somehow implement per pack consistent updates in certain special cases, not by these heavyweight mechanisms, but maybe by updating switches in the right order, exploiting things like uh, the topology or you know, properties of the configurations uh, to uh, avoid having to have extra memory usage and to, and to be able to do things in parallel. And the answer is no, you can't always do this, but in many common cases you can. And if you can't do this, how can we get back into a state where we can use cheaper mechanisms? And sort of the obvious thing to try is to step back from this very strong guarantee where we're preserving all properties and say, well, maybe we're only going to preserve some properties. And so we need a tunable way for programmers to be able to say, you know, these are the properties I care about. Please find me an update that preserves those properties um, or, or fail if you can't. And so that's what we did. So just to show you, uh, returning to our examples, sort of how this works, if we take these two paths, then, in fact, there is an update sequence where we can, so by the way, with this program, I'm, I'm not going to have any, um, you know, configurations that are somehow the combination of two configurations, red and blue. Here, I'm just going to, you know, clobber each device with the, with the red rules, one after the other. And if you do things in this order, you can prove to yourself, it's not that hard, that you will get per pack consistency. And the intuition basically is that before we update A1, we'll have updated uh, C2 so that it can forward downwards. That's sort of the key constraint is that those things have to go in that order and you can't do in the opposite order. Okay. I guess. <laughs> okay. Um, but there's other examples, like this firewall example I showed you before, going through sequences of updates. And uh, in the interest of time, I think I won't step through these in detail, but um, you know, it turns out that all of the sequences of updates you could try are not going to give you per pack consistency. Um, and the reason is that there's sort of these two dependent uh, path changes being made. Uh, and so uh, you, can't, you can't exploit ordering uh, to get uh, path consistency for, uh, for, for any ordering of those updates. Isn't, Sorry, isn't that because you're, in, you're not allowing the one in which as you packets go through both? Yeah, so I don't want any hybrid red blue paths. I want either all blue paths or all red paths. And you can see, I mean, I'll show an example later on, but there's these two diamonds. And whenever you have these two diamonds, mm -hmm. uh, that induces a dependency between when you switch this path and when you switch this path. Yeah. It's, it's, the case that it's, not, it's, it's not the case that blue packets can only flow over the blue path and red packets can only flow over the red path. It's actually both packets will flow over whatever path is programmed into the switches in this example, right? I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, I mean, you're not like you're not segregating your packets somehow so that they can only flow on certain paths. That so, all right, packets, so yeah, yeah. For each for each incoming packet, I can make a choice. Do I want blue or red? But then I have to adhere to that choice. And yeah, well, I'll come back to this with the, the double dime. But the, the, the key point is that the choice, the choice here and the choice here need to be coordinated. And you don't have a way to simultaneously make those two choices. Okay. So can we relax this? Well, in this example. You know, the property we want is basically that all packets are eventually delivered and they take a path that goes across A1 or A2. I don't really care, I think, <laughs> whether the packets take some hybrid path of red and blue as long as these properties are insured. And yeah, so, no, A4, not A1. Oh, these, uh, uh, yeah, the slide's right, but what you said. Oh, yeah, the slide's right, A1 and A4. Um, and now, you know, there's some updates that don't preserve this property, but there's some updates that do. So uh, if I update uh, A2 first, and then A4, and then uh, C1, and then T1, I basically um, you know, pre-populate the, the sort of tail end of the path and then switch over to the at the beginning. OK, so this suggests you know, an approach we can use uh, to synthesize updates that are more efficient in general than the two-phase updates that I showed you a few slides ago. Um, and that give us this way to tune, you know, how strong the guarantee we want. Okay, so there's the question of how we're going to specify these properties. And um, in, in this work, what we did was we sort of took a programming language uh, uh, take on things and assumed we're going to write down properties and some logic. Um, I realized that I earlier said that it's sort of 
not realistic to think that programmers will write down properties and logic. Um, you can think of it as sort of separate future work to think about how you might um, uh, either have a library of common properties that can be sort of composed together by operators or um, find other formalisms that sort of compile into this uh, logic. Um, the logic we use is something called LTL. It's a temporal logic that's been widely used in uh, software and hardware verification. And when you interpret it over finite traces, um, it, tends, it actually has a very simple and intuitive semantics. So I'm not going to show it to you formally, because this isn't the sort of by example, um, the kinds of things we can express. Enough. So for example, if you want to express reachability, every packet that starts at some um, ingress you know, eventually reaches its destination. And we can write that in LTL, basically sort of by conjoining over all possible source destination pairs and saying, if we're ever at the source, then in the future, we reach the destination. So F and LTL means future. We can also express things like waypointing. So if we want to make sure that before we exit the network, all packets uh, traverse W, and then maybe eventually exit, um, we can write that in LTL by saying, um, so there's this, actually this new operator until, and the way to read this is, um, we don't exit the network go through, sorry, that should be W, and then in the future we exit. And then we can start composing these things together to do things like chaining by stringing together multiple untils together. So don't exit until you go across, sorry, that should be W1, and then don't go, uh, don't go across W2 until we go through W2, and then exit. OK, so to instantiate our picture a little more precisely, what's going to work is we're going to provide the topology of the input and final configuration to the network. We'll provide an LTL specification of what properties we want to be preserved. And then there are some additional operational constraints that we actually bake in. Um, so in particular, we're going to only update every switch once. And we're not going to ever install a configuration that's not one of the configurations that the firm wrote down. I have a dumb question. Yep. Is it essentially a substitute for if then statements? The specification that you just showed in the previous slide? Uh, it's, a it's, it's a little bit more powerful than that. So um, maybe I'll take this offline. So L LTL is a, a tractable but reasonably expressive formalism for describing path properties, is the way I would say it. And in your and other papers, you talk about you know, binary decision diagrams, XFDs. This is in addition to that? Uh, so this work actually predates that. I'll come back to the okay. in the end. Okay. okay, so. So why is there a requirement for updating only once? Um, we just did that for simplicity. Okay. So you, you right, there are more programs you could generate if you allow a switch to be updated multiple times. There's also more programs you could generate if you allow a switch to be updated with a partial configuration, or maybe even a configuration that wasn't one of the ones the programmer wrote down. The trade-off is that if you start to relax those assumptions, the search space that your tool has to, has to navigate through becomes enormous, and it's already quite large. So yeah, this is a limitation, but we, we impose these restrictions just to keep things tractable. OK, so the way our tool works sort of graphically is you know, we have our specification. We have sort of the configuration. And what the tool does is sort of a driver that searches through the space of possible update programs. So it's looking through this space. Here I'm sort of drawing new nodes being updated in blue. And it's checking, you know, is my, does my specification still hold in this configuration? Does it hold in this configuration? Does it hold in this configuration? And it actually has to do something a little more complicated. It has to check, you know, does it hold if I take a prefix in the preceding configuration and then I'm in this configuration? So it's kind of a, across two configurations. And what it's trying to do is, you know, define some path where, so every edge in this graph here uh, updates at most one switch. And it wants to find some path that ultimately leads me in a configuration where all devices have been updated. So if it can, then the synthesis succeeds. And if it can't, you know, if it exhaustively searches through the state space, then there's actually no uh, way to find an ordering of switch updates that will preserve my property. And uh, our tool is actually complete. So if it fails, then there somehow was conservative and limited. OK, so in a little bit more detail, I won't go through the algorithm. But essentially, what it's doing is a depth first search uh, through the space of possible updates, attempting to take sort of the current update program and extend it by one more switch. Um, and then when it finds a bad configuration that, that violates our property, it backtracks. So the challenge, of course, is that the search space is enormous. 
you know, each check that we do when we extend by one more switch involves taking the network configuration, actually taking two configurations, as a problem for a model checker, and then asking a model checking question for our, for our LTL formula. And that's, in the general case, P-space complete. So we're in kind of one of these bad, algorithmically bad corners of the world. So the way we were able to speed this up, and this is actually work that uh, Todd started and then, and then Jed uh, sort of finished, is uh, these are sort of two common approaches that are used in a lot of synthesis tools, but the details are kind of interestingly different in this domain. Um, so one is we can learn from counterexamples. So if we're ever in a state and we try to update one more switch and we discover that won't work, we can actually do some post-processing on the failure, and in particular by on the, the example that the model checker gives us about why this violated our property, and sort of generalize it. And then we have a representation of a set of states that are never going to work. So for example, if there's two switches and you know the first switch, sorry, this switch has to be updated before this switch, if we learn that from a counterexample, then we can cut out the whole region of the space where this one comes first, because that's never going to work. And so that lets us, in practice, quickly prune out uh, configurations that violate our, our property. And then the second um, uh, insight, uh, this really came from, from Jed and Pablo, and is, is quite ingenious, is that you know, the series of questions that we're generating for the model checker are very related. So it's not like we're generating very different problems. We're working on the same topology with configurations that, which in the common case are you know, a different, you know, one was generated from, from the previous one, and so they tend to have a lot of similarity. And so if instead of generating fresh questions to the model checker every time um, we make a step, we can somehow reuse all the structures that we've gone to the trouble of serializing and annotating and checking, then uh, we can dramatically speed things up. Um, and in fact, there's a, I have some backup slides, but I clearly don't have time to do this. Um, there's a really nice um, characterization about why this works in terms of the original LTL model checking algorithm by Vardy and, and Sisla. Um, and essentially, it's the, exploiting the fact that we have we're free of loops in a network, and we actually check that before we start our tool. And you can use that to cut out the sort of complicated part of the LTL model checking algorithm. And you can get a quick incremental algorithm that um, that sort of works with an, uh, a previous model and updates it with some new changes. Okay, so so that's kind of the I'll show you some numbers in a little bit, but that's that's kind of how the synthesis algorithm works. Um, the main limitation, of course, is that there are topologies, configurations, and specifications where there's no correct ordering we can use. And the prototypical example is this uh, double diamond example where you have to make a coordinated change here and here. Um, we actually studied this. There's a disk paper this year where we looked at, um, came up with an algorithm for coming up with optimal consistent updates, consistent order updates. Um, and you know, these examples of the, that you can have, have this gadget, then you can do it, do it in polynomial time. Practice what our tool does is if the checker fails, we update. I want to quickly show you uh, our evaluation. And I should say this is a sort of PL synthesis style evaluation. I'm not uh, going to make claims about um, you know, the real world practicality of this approach. Um, there were two questions we wanted to look at. One was, you know, how well our optimization is doing. And two, how does it scale in terms of size of topology, complexity of the specification, and how much of the search space are we actually exploring? Um, so to do this, we took some real-world topologies, uh, topologies from topology zoo, factories, and generated small-world topologies. We uh, didn't have configurations for all these topologies, so we wrote some uh, configuration generators that would give us um, you know, pairs of configurations that were similar in some intuitive way, like they'd added some new hosts, or deleted some devices, or added a new constraint, like waypointing through a new firewall. So we wrote a bunch of these generators, and then we took a bunch of sort of stock properties and ran uh, experiments on all of these things. And I'll just show you a couple of uh, graphs that show you know, the impact of some of these uh, of our key insights. Um, so the first is looking at you know, what happens when you run the model checker in batch mode versus incrementally. Um, so these two plots are for two different topologies. This is aggregated over all of the topologies, new topologies, and this is for a, a series of factories that we uh, turned up and down the size. And what you can see is that our, model, our incremental tool uh, is doing you know, very well. It's basically almost flat, at least after very large inputs. 
Um, actually, our, our batch tool was doing pretty well uh, because we were cutting out the, uh, the cost of serialization. And just for comparison, we ran against uh, new SMB, which is a, a industrial strength uh, LTL model checker. Um, and uh, that was actually not doing so well for, uh, for these inputs, but that's solving a more general problem than our model checker. Um, so we, we also compared against um, is it NetFlumber, the incremental one that you guys did, mm -hmm. um, and found similar. Uh, I think NetFlumber was somewhere between the batch and the, and the SMB. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I don't want to draw too many conclusions from this uh, from this graph because again, a lot of our inputs are synthetic. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think the things you can draw away are you, know, you can build a backend solver if you exploit incrementality that will scale to reasonably large inputs and basically solve problems nearly instantaneously. Um, yeah, and then we also looked at <coughs> um, scalability when we um, both when we dialed up the sort of power of the of the specification uh, and when we made the the inputs bigger. And we looked both at you know inputs where there was some feasible update order and ones where there was some infeasible update order. Um, so in this case, we're actually exhaustively searching the the state space for unless we prune it away. Um, and again, sort of the key takeaways are again for these synthetic inputs, we can find update orders in sort of uh, tens to hundreds of seconds for modestly sized uh, inputs with, um, I believe, hundreds of switches updating. Okay, so I'm going to shift quickly to this last part of the talk unless there's questions about this. Yeah, John. How long does it take to? Program uh, kind of a, a network with this uh, with this scheme. Uh, kind of what you have, kind of one set of updates to have hybrid, kind of red and blue, and then edge, and then uh, kind of re revert to this, this three. So here, you might have these paths of upgrades that are very long. Kind of, do you have a sense of how long these paths are? Yeah. So I think what I've pointed you to ask that question is. Look at the work by Ratul Mahajan and Jen Rexford and, and their students in I think, Dionysus, where they looked at the effect of choosing orders to speed up, to basically uh, eliminate bottlenecks and speed, speed up uh, updates. And they're also using order based updates, and they have uh, an evaluation on, on real hardware, which we didn't do. Um, the thing that we looked at is uh, more characterizing you know, when, when can you find parallelism and when do you have to either sequence or, 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 in fact, sometimes you have to do a, a fairly strict barrier, like wait for all packets to the network. Um, so our disk paper characterizes that situation for, for packet system updates. So the short version is we don't have numbers that answer that question, but retro and gen. OK, um, I'm a little short on time, so I'm going to just give you a taste of the second part of the talk. Um, this is a paper that was in PL PLDI this year, and the motivation is, you know, this picture is getting kind of antiquated. Um, there's new kinds of data planes that are coming out that expose uh, much richer uh, features. And so you know, rather than having this controller having to sort of propagate these configurations one after the other onto stateless devices, we'd like to push the actual state in our program into the data plane. So what's the right model for that? Um, and I have a series of examples. I think in the interest of time, what I'll do is skip over a few of them and just show you selected inputs. Um, so here's a simple example where we have a stateful firewall. We have two switches connected by some set of links that are close connected to them. And what we want is that you know H1 can initiate communication to the outside world, but the outside world cannot communicate until it's received uh, a packet from H1. Just jump to this one. Here's a more complicated example where uh, this is, I don't know if there's any practical use of this, but uh, H1 can do the same thing, but here it can actually multicast some request to the outside world. And then the outside world can reply, but only the first host to actually uh, to, to send an act to that request gets to then communicate with the host. So it's a more complicated protocol. OK, so the first thing we're going to do is to sort of come up with some model that lets us express these stateful data plane programs. And because I have like two minutes, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of that. Until 1.15. I do. Yeah. Oh, all right. Mm -hmm. Yep. OK. Then I will not go so fast. Um, so like many other people, I'll, I'll show some related work uh, in a few minutes. You know, we uh, decided to model these things as a kind of finite state machine. 
Um, but the details are a little bit different. Um, so we call these event transition systems. And the idea is that the states correspond to network-wide configurations. So think of it as sort of static forwarding in you know, given fixing a state. And the transitions correspond to network level events like receiving a packet at a particular switch. So I think this is a fairly natural formalism that you can use to express a lot of stateful programs. But the challenges, of course, are how can we come up with implementations that, that aren't inefficient in some fundamental way? And where we get some reasonable consistency guarantees when there's concurrent packets flowing through the network, making state changes, and uh, possibly changing the way that forwarding happens. To show you the example now in this formalism, we can write as uh, event transition systems. It happens to just have two states with one event connecting them. And in the first state, think of this as a static configuration where H1 can send traffic to H4. So there's a path configured on the switches using forwarding rules, et cetera, et cetera. And C2 uh, allows H1 and H4 to communicate. And the event that lets us trigger that is when a packet going from H1 to H4 is received on S4, then we can make that configuration change. That's state change. But the persistent state that you're talking about, where is it present? Uh, I'm not going to commit to that right now because this is an abstract programming model. I'll tell you how to implement this. I'll tell you one way to implement this in a couple of slides. But you know, don't, don't think about things that way. Thank you. <laughs> OK, here's, uh, I skipped that one, so I'll jump to this one. So here's our more complicated, maybe slightly fanciful distributed firewall. So now we have this more complicated state machine with four states. Um, in the first state, H1 can send requests, and those get actually multicast out to everyone. In the second state, H1 can still send requests. Maybe the request got dropped, so I might want to send it again. But in addition, H4 and H5 can send acts back to H1. And then in in C3 and C C4, either H4 or H5 is allowed to send traffic to H1 and vice versa. And the events that get us back and forth are so E2 is the is that H H1 request packet going out, and E3 and E4 are act packets coming from H4 or H5. Okay. So you know the key question is how should we implement these the network-wide updates that are implied by these kind of simple, I would argue, natural uh, state machine diagrams. And so the solution we came up with, the way I would describe it intuitively, is we start from per packet consistency, because that lets the programmer kind of think about forwarding uh, in, a, you know, in a very simple way without thinking about all the intermediate states that a packet might see. But the state updates we handle with a causally consistent model. And so in a little more detail, what that looks like is you know, all packets are either processed by C1 or C2, and different packets may be processed by different configurations. And if all of the switches that are involved in processing a single packet have heard about some event E, then C2 must be used. And dually, if none of the switches involved in processing a packet have heard about some event E, then, then this event E in particular, then, uh, sorry, that should be C1, then C1 must be used. So basically, the network's in this state. It's kind of indeterminate. Um, and uh, you know, these two conditions specify you know, when, when the transition must not happen or must happen. Um, and in the middle, we have a free choice. But we have to do things with perfect consistency. So we found this a quite natural way to express a lot of the staple applications that people have been thinking about. In particular, the, you know, this guarantee plus these state changes um, Captured the, the sort of intuitive correctness conditions of these applications. And as I'll describe, this thing has a, a reasonable implementation strategy that doesn't require uh, things like excessive coordination or packet buffering, which anything stronger would require. Okay, so there's one fly in the ointment, which is uh, um, fanciful distributed firewall, was sort of carefully concocted to have this funny action. That is, um, so here's the ETS. And what can happen is from H1, and then maybe both of these hosts decide, hey, I want to talk to H1, and they send their ACK. 
And at this point, our ETS says we have to take the E3 transition or the E4 transition. So, sorry, this is all gotten backwards. Uh, but this is the E3 act, and this is the E4 act. And, and then the network wide configuration has to jump to a state where only there's only one H1 to H4, H5 path. And so it's pretty clear that you can't really do this without some, in some way, coordinating those two devices. Right, so switches H4 and H5, S5, sorry, S4 and S5 need to somehow have a conversation with themselves and decide which of the acts we receive first and therefore who should get to communicate. Um, but it's totally unclear how you could do this efficiently. And so the sort of obvious thing to do, and the thing we did, was to impose a condition on ETSs to ensure that this situation doesn't arise. So we call this the locality condition. And the idea is that any events that are simultaneously enabled uh, at a state must be somehow compatible with each other. And I won't give you a formal definition of compatibility, but the intuitive definition is, you know, they can't induce state changes on distributed devices. So another intuition is basically rule out anything that requires action at a distance. Um, again, since this is in PL seminar, I won't take you through the sort of more formal motivation for all this, but uh, this is actually closely related to some work that Glenn Winskill at Cambridge has been working on for many years in a system he calls event structures, which is an abstract characterization of uh, how concurrent systems work and, uh, and exactly these kinds of situations. So there's a nice sort of pedigree to this, uh, for this kind of framework and this kind of condition. Okay, so our main result was we proved that uh, an ETS can be implemented efficiently in the network if and only if it satisfies that locality condition. Um, where efficiently means that there's a fixed bound on the amount of time that any packet could have to buffer a packet before processing it. Um, the super sketchy proof sketch is basically it's very much like the cap theorem, um, and the sort of crux of the proof is that you know without this locality condition, there's programs where some switch would have to buffer an unbounded amount of uh, traffic before deciding what to do with you know, the first packet. Okay, so that's the sort of negative result, the only if of the, of the if and only if. And then the positive result is we constructed an implementation and actually built this uh, by modifying the Stanford reference open flow switch and then building a, a controller frame around it. And the way it implements ETSs is, is it encodes uh, each of the states in the ETS using uh, sets of events. Um, and then we literally uh, carry these sets or encodings of these sets on packets. So uh, packets are sort of tagged with a digest that captures a set of events that determines which state in the ETS we're in. And then switches have uh, configurations predicated on the sets of events or states. And so we can decide what to do with each as to get our sort of causal consistencies also propagate digests of the events they've seen. So the way to think about this is a packet hop, uh, that switch is in some state. So that's the state that's used to process that packet all the way through the network. But as it goes, it may learn about other events. And so there's, it's sort of gathering up information about other states or other events that might imply some transition to another state. And so the switches take those digests and incorporate them into their local state. And now, effectively, they transition to the new states once they've learned about all the events that imply that state. So um, we did some very simple sort of micro benchmarks to show that this works. Um, so here's our state with firewall. And we compared the a naive implementation, sort of written as people would in an SDN controller like Frenetic or Fox. Um, and what you see here is these are plots of uh, just ping probes. And, uh, at the point where the transition happens, with the so low means dropped and high means uh, received. So here's H1 sending traffic, and you see H2 doesn't, 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 and then it jumps up. And with the ETS-based implementation, is actually a, a perfect transition. So there's no gap between when the H1 packet goes out and when the H2 packet can, uh, can send its response. Just to show you one more example, we implemented again a, a Toy micro benchmark, but a learning switch as an ETS for over a fixed set of MAC addresses, obviously. And uh, so that here the transition that's happening is going from flooding to not flooding. 
once you've learned about uh, your address. And the naive implementation, again, using Frenetic, um, you know, floods for a long period of time after it's learned about the addresses because there's this longer longer latency control loop and reconfiguration that happens. And with ETSs, we perfectly start in between these blocks. So this is the number of packets that are going to H1 in blue and to H2 in red. And so what should happen is uh, H2 is not the packet that's involved, sorry, not the host that's involved. And so it should stop receiving packets that are destined for H1. What you see with the naive implementation is this period where we receive sort of flooded packets that, that are not for H2. For H2. Whereas with ETS, is a perfect, you know, as soon as we learn, uh, H2 stops being flooded with packets. Okay. So now I am down to two minutes. <laughs> um, so what we're doing currently is um, trying to uh, apply another form of synthesis to these ETSs. And again, the super high-level idea is um, we want to take simple finite state <coughs> machine descriptions of the functionality and then synthesize the ETS structure. And the way you think about this, the way you think about this is we're basically synthesizing the con concurrency control. So these are sort of provided, and then we synthesize these transitions. Um, and concretely, what this looks like is we provide a set of traces. So each color is a different uh, contiguous trace um, of a packet trace. And then we get positive examples of behavior that's good, negative examples of behaviors that's bad, and then generate uh, one of these finite state machines from that set of examples. And the other thing we're doing is building a P4 implementation of our ETSs. Um, and so the, the sort of high level goal here is to get away from some of the naive aspects of our first prototype where we were uh, representing states in a not very compact way. And mo most importantly, we had to keep all of the configurations for the entire ETS. In the next. And so uh, we have some clever ideas about how to build sort of interpreter for um, an intermediate representation of configurations called FTDs, you uh, asked about, which is a, yeah, a description of sort of what happens on one device. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're sort of hopeful that that will be, let us basically write a constant size program that executes each device, but can still interpret um, you know, the full set of, of ETSs. OK, so to wrap up, so all this is based on these three papers, uh, SIGCOM paper on consistent updates, and then a couple of PLDI papers on synthesizing updates on this event-driven programming model. Um, there's a lot of related work. Uh, you asked, Bobby asked about, about some other work I don't have here, but maybe to pick just four of the most closely related papers. Um, Ratul Mahajan and Roger Waffenhofer and John Rexford and their students and collaborators, Shukant Kandula, um, have written a series of papers looking at um, uh, these order-based updates uh, from a more systems perspective. And I've done some really nice work um, uh, there. And then there's uh, a, a few papers. Uh, these are maybe two of the, the ones that I, I'm aware of and sort of like the best, trying to develop um, net network-wide stateful programming models uh, for things like uh, P4 devices. Um, so there's Open State, which is a project out of Milano. It's also based on a finite state machine representation of uh, of packet processing programs. And then there's the SNAP work that someone asked about before. Um, the main difference, if you want, between the SNAP work and ETSs is, is SNAP is based on this uh, single, one big switch abstraction. So you can't actually program the paths through the network. You just program the input output behavior, but you get to manipulate state. And the compiler uses some very clever representations and algorithms to locate that state on certain devices um, and to give you uh, a sort of strong consistency semantics. Um, ETS is let you actually program the paths, which makes programming more complicated, but gives you some kind of brand control. So these are sort of two complementary approaches to the problem. And I'll stop there and again encourage you if you like topology mm -hmm. and continuous math to come to Stephen's talk tomorrow. Any questions? Good, thank you. Thank you. Can you um, I would imagine through an anticipation of what the question that someone else might ask. So you were showing towards the end a sort of how this might be applied to something that was expressed in P4. Mm -hmm. Can you give us an example of what that might look like? Of what the program looks like? Yeah. Of what that, of, I think it might make more concrete. For yeah. So, more so the basic, um, 
Yeah. Again, essentially, what is the what what is the interpreter? So let me, let me characterize the problem more precisely. So in our current implementation, we take uh, we have a CTS which I've not drawn here. It has a bunch of network wide configurations, and we go and compile those into forwarding tables. So we have a set of forwarding tables, and we can partition it by switch. And so we have this basically dictionary from states to tables. And now um, you could imagine a controller that does some kind of caching scheme to try to keep the current states on the on the switches, but what our implementation did was just assume the switches have enough space and push the entire configuration uh, onto the switches. And that's obviously silly. Like you couldn't implement an actual learning switch that way because it's space to represent all possible addresses. Um, so the idea here is um, we'd like to specialize the tables. To, so we'd like the program on the just be implementing tracking and the transitions between states in a generic way. Mm -hmm. And we'd like the forwarding to sort of be provided elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, I'm aware that you know active networks is kind of a, this exotic thing that's a dirty word. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of come back in vogue with, with some recent papers like the active programs yeah. uh, system. Mm -hmm. And so our, our view is that you know if you, if you don't want to push all these programs into the data plane, then it's going to have to come from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And if we assume that we have some devices at the edge that can attach you know, a program to the packet that uh, is, is small enough uh, to, to fit, and where we can run a generic interpreter on the switches that interprets those programs, then we can basically refactor where, that, where those configurations have to live. So very concretely, what, the, what that looks like is, you know, for us, a network-wide forwarding configuration can be given by, by a collection of these. And so, um, what, what we're currently playing with, and we have some proposals, but nothing concrete that I want to uh, commit to, is ways of serializing sets of FDDs and then writing P4 programs that can take a packet, deserialize part of the FDD, and decide what transformation to do yeah. in the, you know, at that level. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Any questions? I have a, a very uh, good. Oh. So I think one of, the, one of the challenges for this sort of approach being successful is going to be sort of the the user interface or the sort of programmer spacing interface of what, how do they generate these uh, configurations or specifications. And you know, we've seen, you know, this, I mean, I like LTL, it's cool, but it's, it's also kind of cryptic and mathematical. Uh, also, state machines are maybe easier to understand, but they're harder perhaps to verify that the, they're logically correct. And actually implement what you are trying to, what you, the behavior that you desire. And so, what are your thoughts of like, you know, how what the sort of programmer or operator facing surface will be, and how to make that as sort of reliable and convenient and expressive as possible? And it's a bit orthogonal, but it's yeah. So, a, a, I guess a, a my first challenge. response is yes, super important problem, and I don't know that I have any special skills or insights about how to solve that problem. And I think to do that kind of work is a bit different than the goals mm -hmm. of this kind of work. And that's not to say it's not important. It's maybe more important, and it's harder in a different dimension. Yeah, but I think I mean I think this is really cool. I think that that um, you know, that the challenge to get it adopted will be will it will really very much depend on that upward facing layer. Yeah. So I mean, <clears throat> the optimistic view is you know if you look like intent based networking is sort of a buzzword at the moment. I know there's a talk here on Tuesday. I think about about that. You know what is what is the mechanism used to do intent based networking? It's it's things mm -hmm. similar yeah. to to these kinds of structures, and so. Um, two different modes of research. I mean, you could sort of start from the human-facing, you know, operator, operator intuitive set of abstractions, and then develop systems based on top of that. Um, you may or may not sort of hit on the more canonical algorithms and data structures, or you could take this other perspective and try to you know, figure out things that are maybe assuming someone else will solve that problem, which is basically what we're doing. And then, yeah. and yeah, I'm not. Well, thanks. Maybe somebody else has a more specific question about the topic. Yeah, so it's I wonder what, what you thought about that. I was, you know, you, you alluded to a bunch of things, you know, versus persistent state packets and state variables required to change them. Then in some other work, there is service chaining policies. And recently, there was another talk here a few weeks ago in which they were talking about multiple companies 
using some sort of API to control different uh, NFV. The domain keeps growing exponentially with the amount of you know state that you have. You see a role for presentation, which puts so middlemen and handle all of this nice and for everyone, not just for people. Um, I mean, yes and no, I guess. So, um, yes, and I think you're seeing tools that are starting to, to get that niche you just described. Um, from a pragmatic perspective, no, I don't think there's ever going to be one Uber framework that has everything and that all of this is set in sense. I mean, that would be wonderful, of course, but I don't think it's very realistic in the short term. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.